Now, good evening, friends, and welcome once again. Now, where did we put this little speaker? Are we there? Amen. You can hear, can you? Well, good evening, and welcome to our revival meeting tonight. We're so glad to have each one of you with us, and our prayer is that God, in His faithfulness, will open the truth of His Word and minister life into all of our hearts. And a special word of welcome to those who are here tonight for the first time as visitors. We rejoice that you're able to be with us. We've only got one more not night left. And let's be in prayer that we'll finish on a glorious climactic note. And we praise the Lord for the opportunity. Now, pastor got me to be able to go to a Mexican restaurant today. <laughs> Hey, I've never gone, never enjoyed going there, but I tell you today, <laughs> it was out of this world, and I'm planning to come back, <laughs> bring my wife with me. <laughs> We're going to read tonight from the Word of God, from the Luke's Gospel, uh, chapter 3, if you have your Bibles with you. Luke's Gospel, chapter 3, and from the first verse. <clears throat> now in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate, being governor of Judea, Herod, being tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Euteria, and the region of Trachoniatus, and Lysanias, Tetrarch of Abilene. While Annas and Caiaphas were high priests, the word of God came to John, the son of Zacharias, in the wilderness. And he went into all the region around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins as is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough way smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Just so far, and may the Lord add his blessing and interpretation to his word here tonight. We're going to bow for a moment in prayer. I want you just to repeat a prayer after me quietly as we invite the Spirit of God to speak to our hearts. Lord, speak to my heart tonight. May I hear your voice and sense your presence. We believe, God, that you brought us here tonight by divine appointment. You alone know our needs and that with which we wrestle on the inside. We can be laughing on the outside but crying on the inside. There are struggles and battles that rage. But we pause in your presence because you are the God that created us in your image and for yourself. And you've given to us a free will that we can use to respond to your love, to every initiative that you've taken. And I pray that tonight will be no exception. May we sense that we stand on holy ground. May we sense that we stand in the presence of the living God. And grant that indeed that as we do so, there will come that still small voice of your spirit, offering life, the bread of life, the living water, the light of the world, the resurrection and the life 
the joy of forgiveness of sin, and the way, the truth, and the life, and all that we need in an hour of darkness. And so we pray that right now, your voice will be sounded within this room. Bless each home and family represented here. We come from different situations, backgrounds, events of the day, we thank you we can come from all that's been happening and draw aside and gather with the body of Christ. And as we do so, we thank you you've committed yourself to be with us. So grant that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts shall be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen and amen. The country of Israel was in crisis. There were problems on every hand. Subversive elements were operating underground. The country was under Roman authority and Roman rule. There were fears of the possibility of rebellion. And so what they did in order to be able to maintain the balance of power and control, they divided the country into different segments. And over each area or each province, they would place a ruler whose task it was to rule with a rod of iron to wipe out any possibility of insurrection from the Jews. What we have listed here in verse 1 is the whole bank shoot of all these Roman governors that they had been appointed to keep control and keep Rome in domination. We find here in this passage of Scripture something rather significant in an hour of political crisis in an hour when there was oppression and deception on every side, you would hear different voices. And we have them listed here. For instance, there was the voice of the politicians. We have the whole list of them here. The reign of Tiberius Caesar, Pontius Pilate. We have Herod. We have Philip the Tetrarch, and Lysanias, Tetrarch of Abilene. And wherever you went, the voice of the politicians were being heard. These seemed to have the say over the nations. And then there was another group that would have a say and take advantage of the situation. We have here listed in verse 2, Annas and Caiaphas. These were the so-called religious leaders of the day. Their voice was also used. Their voice cashed in on the crisis situation that was facing the country at that time. So you have the voice of the politicians, the voice of the religious leaders. But then there was another voice. We read these words here. And the word of God came to John. I'm so glad he was John the Baptist and not the Methodist. <laughs> In other words, there was another voice. It was the voice of God addressing the nation in this crucial hour of their history. My friends, just a, just a trace of history this has been the procedure right through the ages that in spite of all the voices that are being heard like a modern Tower of Babel, many voices appealing to us, calling us, there comes another voice. It's the voice of God. My friend, can I urge you tonight to hear the voice of God? 
He longs to speak to the nation. You're hearing the voice of the politicians and all that they have to say and all the promises that they make. Never keep, of course. We have the voice of so-called religious voices. But there is the other voice. It is the voice of the Spirit of God. Thank God tonight that you and I worship a voice, a God who speaks into every situation. He is not detached nor divorced from what's happening in this world. The politicians are having their say, so-called religion are having their say, friends. But God is speaking and he is calling each one of us to a fresh attention to hear what the Spirit has to say in an hour of national and international crisis, in an hour, friends, when many are like John here, right in the wilderness, where there's loneliness and depression, where there are all kinds of evil forces loose, God finds John the Baptist in that national hour and uses him in spite of the wilderness. When there are economic and technological problems round about us and they fail, they can't even find a missing aircraft in spite of all our so-called advance in science and technology. When human hatred and insanity is at its worst, when the deception of materialism has done its thing, and where they are, there is religious deception. In spite of all those things that cloud the horizon, the voice of God can be heard. And the Bible says, the Bible says, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit has to say. You see, friends, apart from God's intervention, I don't know where we're going. I don't know who to trust. The world is in economic trouble. The world is in all kinds of trouble. War could break out. Anything could happen. The Middle East could erupt. The politicians have had their say. But we have to look beyond the immediate into the future for our children and grandchildren. What is he saying? If we're part of the church, the body of Christ, surely the head of the church has something to say. We're not here, friends, just to experience all the drama that's going on. We are here and called as the alternative society. And he addresses us. And as I look into this passage of Scripture, there are a number of things that I believe he is saying. The first thing I would submit to you tonight is he is saying that I'm spelling out my sovereignty. I'm spelling out my sovereignty that I will have the final say, that I'm still in control even though it would seem as if our Christian cause is a useless cause, as the forces of darkness are seeking to wipe out our witness out of our schools, out of our, uh, uh, our, uh, our governments, out of society. God is saying here, he wants us to know that he still is a sovereign God that has not abdicated the throne. But he wants us to know, friends, certain things about him being a sovereign God. The first is that righteousness exalteth the nation. History tells us where there's been corruption in the highest courts of the land, the places have collapsed. Righteousness exalteth the nation and sin is a reproach to any people. We seem to think that somehow God closes his eyes and ignores what's going on round about us. But there comes the hour when sovereign power intervenes and the hand of judgment is known. You see, his sovereign power is expressed in sometimes in some of the unexpected events. Things take place that we can't understand. 
You see, our little minds are too small to comprehend what God is really doing. We see some of the things that are taking place, the tsunamis, the collapses here and there, the unexpected wars, the things that are happening, friends, that should not happen. And we don't realize that behind these events, there is a God that is seeking to get our attention. Somehow we don't hear. The uncertainties of life, the uncontrolled interruptions, and so it goes on. That behind all that's happening that mankind is doing, God is still on the throne. Somehow we've reached the stage and we think we don't need God. These are, there are different laws in place now about the danger of offending people. Don't say this, we might offend that group. And we don't say that, we might offend that group. And we've got to be careful what we say from the pulpit even. But somehow, friends, we're not worried about offending God. We don't seem to care. We've torn His Word out of the Scriptures. We've violated His commandments. And there is no fear of God of offending Him as an individual, as a family, as a country, and as a nation. What happens when we do that? God says here in the book of Job, chapter 38, verse 4, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? Have you commanded the morning and your days began, since your days began? Have you comprehended the breadth of the earth? We're only just a speck of dust, friends out there in the vastness, in the vastness of the universe. And somehow on that speck of dust, mankind looks at his creator, and shakes his fist at him, and defies him at every level. He's saying, John, I'm still on the throne. And I will allow mankind to go so far and then no further. He has drawn that line. He has said in the scriptures, my spirit shall not always strive with man. I find it amazing to think that that same God that created us, that same God that has allowed us to go on and on and on, will send his spirit to strive, to call, to appeal, until we cross that dead line. When we hear no warning signs anymore. When into our darkness and spiritual loneliness we plunge. Past the point of no return. Don't we understand that man's heyday is not the same as God's payday and never the same day. There comes that hour. I'm spelling out my sovereignty. Never forget that. Never forget that. Those politicians, those religious leaders of that day would not have the final say. God spoke. Thank God he speaks. I'd hate to be in that twilight, silent zone when I don't hear his voice anymore. And I've been left alone to my wanderings in darkness to which many seem to be racing to. The next thing that he says here is, I'm searching for my servants. You see, this has been his policy down through history. <clears throat> servants are people that are usable to God. In the midst of all that's happened in history, right through from the dawn of creation, right through, God would find his servants. He would use, as we saw last night, Esther. He used Abraham. He used David. He used Daniel. He used Amos. He used Elijah. Right through history, no matter what was taking place, God singled out those whom he could trust with truth and whom he could use to make a profound difference on the generation in which we live. Where are my servants? Where are those that are prepared to walk the heights with me, 
prepared to stand alone if necessary, even if it involves, involves being politically incorrect as John was against the immoralities of the day. I read an interesting thing some time ago about a famous French philosopher, political philosopher who visited the United States on a mission to learn what, the, what quality enabled a handful of people to defeat the mighty British Empire and declare your independence. What was the secret of the phenomenal growth of this nation? This is what he said. Listen carefully. I sought for the greatness and genius of America in her commodious harbors and her ample rivers, and it was not there. In the fertile fields and the boundless prairies, and it was not there. In her rich mines and her vast world of commerce, and it was not there. It not until I went into the churches of America and heard the pulpits aflame with righteousness did I understand the secrets of her genius and power. The USA, he said, is great because she's good. And if America ceases to be good, she ceases to be great. You see, friends, the success of this nation is because you built on the right foundation. Because there were men and women that stood against the powers of evil, that decided to build it on God's land. Thank God for each one. Will you be one of those who will stand in the way? Take John for a moment. He didn't have much by way of looks. What appearances, these weren't the emphasis of his life. He had a clear estimate of himself. He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Now, you'll recall earlier that Jesus is described as the Word. The Word. So if Jesus is the Word, John the Baptist is the voice. What's more important? The word that goes forth, the word that's declared. And so he sees himself in terms of his estimate of himself against the one whom he proclaims. Just a voice crying in the wilderness. He had a single purpose in life. He said, he must increase, but I must decrease. We've changed it around, haven't we? But not John. It's no wonder God could trust him as a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, having this single purpose in life. A servant that God could use. When last did you bring your life with all its talents and opportunity and say, Lord, I want to be your servant because it means if I'm your servant, then you're the master. You determined where I go. You determined what I say. You determined my course of action. My direction comes from you. My life is no longer my own. You're a servant of the Most High God. And by the way, friends, there's no greater privilege. If God has called you to serve Him, don't stoop to become a king. Where are the servants of God? Where are those in this hour of national crisis when the world's on the edge of Armageddon? Are there those that will stand up and say, Lord, I'll be counted. Here's my life. I've got one life to live. And I want every day to count. I cannot afford to waste another minute of my life. I've lived for the world, the flesh, and the devil for so long. But from tonight, here's my life. Consecrated. Surrendered to you. I don't know if that's so easy. In fact... It's easier said than done. Here I come to the Lord. I've heard him speak. And I want to be one of his servants. I want to make that full surrender. So God says to me, well, 
What have you got? What do you want to surrender? So you know what we usually do? We usually surrender the things you don't want. <laughs> you can have that and that. Uh, the problem people in my life, please take them, please. <laughs> he takes the same principle that he applied in heaven long ago when he sent the best that heaven could offer. And said, what do you treasure the most? I said, Lord, yes, Jeanette. She means everything to me. She's my life. put her on the altar and I say hang on Lord she's my wife I can't make that kind of surrender what happens if you take her he took my first wife in the car accident I don't know if I can make that kind of surrender and eventually after a struggle I'll place her on the altar she's yours Lord what else you got I got my children David and Andre and Chanel well, put them on the altar. Hey, Lord, those are my children. You can't take them from me. I struggle. And then the grand, oh my, don't touch those grandchildren. I've got nine of them back in Africa. Put them all on the altar. I tell you, and I struggle to surrender them to him. What happens if he takes one? What else you got? Oh, we got a little... A uh, townhouse back in South Africa. Give it to me. But where am I going to stay? Where am I going to live? That's my business. You just put it on the altar. Your bank account. Oh, there's not much there. You can have it. <laughs> <laughs> my motor car. You can have that too. Until eventually it's all on the altar. Everything that's dear, precious, I've let go of it. Then he does something wonderful. He comes to where I am, and he sees I'm broken before him, and I've surrendered everything that is meaningful and wonderful in my life, for which I just enjoy life for. And he says, here's Jeanette. She's mine now. She's on loan to you. Treat her the way the Bible says you should treat your wife. Love her. And she's back on loan. They are the children. They mine. But let them grow up to call you blessed. They back on loan. And those grandkids. But they're on loan. They're my property now. After all, I created them. Here's your apartment where you live. Make it a place where people are welcome and where the glory of God dwells. No evil is allowed. Here's your car. Watch those rules of the road, the way they drive here and drive there are two different things. <laughs> Here's your bank account. And then I begin to realize that I own nothing. It's all on loan. You owe nothing, my friend. Someone put it like this. Um, are you rich today? Out of everything you have that money cannot buy and that death cannot take away, that, then you will know how rich you really are. What have we got in life that death can't take away? What have we got in life that money cannot buy? We kill ourselves, rob ourselves to try and get what money can buy. But you've got nothing. God is looking for servants that are empty of themselves and their own agendas in life and are willing to make that total surrender unconditionally. And my friends, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to keep what he cannot lose. I am shouting out my, salvation, my solution, says God. You see, John had a message for that day. And I find it amazing to think that the same message that John preached that day so long ago in that kind of culture is the same message the church is called to preach today. 
I preach there on every continent of the world with the same impact and the same effect. John preached not a watered down gospel, but it was a message based on the vision. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He had a message and he called people to repent. Even the king, he challenged the king. It cost him his head, but that king never forgot. That king will stand at the judgment seat one day and says, you were warned, but your sin consumed you. But I sent you a message. My friends, we have a message. And like Paul of old, we can say, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. We had a radical change in South Africa in 1994. Up until then, we had what they called an apartheid government of legalized segregation with all the pain that kind of policy brought and the racial hatred that came through in many ways. And then the government was changed and a new government came under Nelson Mandela. And you know what? There's still racial hatred because a change of government and government policy doesn't change human hearts. It's a change of heart that counts. The politicians can't. No one else can, friends, but Jesus. That's why Jesus came. He cut right across the great divides and says, come now and let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they can be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they can be as wool. The gospel cuts across the agendas of carnal man and calls us to walk another path. It's the highway of holiness that very few are prepared to walk. And you can't walk on that road with your heart in another direction. It's full surrender. I'll never forget when I was part of a team that went into the heart of Russia some years ago after the Cold War had stopped. There were teams from the USA and from South Africa and the UK. We got onto a train in Moscow and it went 1,100 miles the other side of Moscow into the Volga Valley. An amazing experience. We found people that had never seen foreigners before. We preached in every conceivable factory, school, anywhere we could go. The doors were wide open. We traveled for two nights on the train to get there. And one night I was standing in the corridor of that train and I was speaking to a gentleman from, the, from Florida here in the United States. And he was telling me how that he was a retired lieutenant colonel of the U.S. Army. He'd spent his final years in a think tank in West Germany during the days of the Cold War. He spent his time planning strategies that if war broke out, how they could destroy as many Russian people as possible. Spent 10 years in that think tank. He said, I've met Jesus and I'm going into Russia tonight not to spread death, but life. The next night we were in a city called Penza, a city about a million people. We took the town hall and had a wonderful rally there. Hundreds came. This man gave his testimony. This man whose story I've just related to you now. This retired lieutenant colonel. He told the Russian people what his job in life was. By how that Christ had changed his heart and given him a love for the people of Russia. After the meeting, a well-dressed Russian gentleman comes to meet him. And through an interpreter, he says, I need to talk to you in the privacy of my home. If you and your interpreter will come with me, I'd like to talk to you at home. And they went into his living room at home. And the Russian said to this gentleman from the U.S., he said, is it true what you said tonight, that you're a retired lieutenant colonel of the American army? He said, yes. Is it true that you spent your last 10 years in that think tank, planning ways and means to wipe out as many Russians as possible? He said, yes, 
But I also told you tonight that I've met Jesus and he's given me a new heart for the people of Russia. When he had finished, the Russian said through an interpreter, I also am a retired lieutenant colonel of the Russian army. I also spent my last few years in a Russian think tank how we could destroy America. But I've also found the same Jesus you found. And tonight, we are brothers. We are brothers. Only Jesus can do that, my friend. He can take the hardest, cruelest heart and bring it together. That's the gospel. For if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. Have you known that, my friend? Or is that just something interesting for someone else? Where your heart is no longer the same. It's your heart that God wants. That's the message of the gospel. Then he says here, I'm also signaling a new era in history. What's happening is not just by chance. I have a plan behind it all. I have dictated, I have declared how things will change out there. Nation against nation, earthquakes and tremors, famines and disasters. They've been spelt out before our eyes. <laughs> you see, friends, John is preaching about a kingdom. John had a task. Listen carefully. He had a task to prepare the way for the first coming of Jesus. We have the task of preparing the way for the next coming of Jesus. And the task is even more risky and more challenging. What a challenge it is. You see, we have inside information. You can't place your hopes for the future on a calculated guess. We all have different kinds of worldviews. We base it on just our own ideas and hopes that everything will come right. Uh, take a look back and see it hasn't come right. But there is a worldview in the scripture that tells us about the consummation of history. And Jesus, it has an hour that you think not the Son of Man is coming. And our job, as John was, uh, John, uh, John did, is to prepare the way. You see, one of the signs of the last days will be the false Christs. We were out in the Philippines some years ago doing a crusade down in the south of the Philippines. And one night, the one brother pastor that I was with, we turned on the television and there was a service coming out of, uh, a church service coming out of Manila, a man speaking in perfect English to thousands of people. And the television was, uh, uh, was telecast across Asia. And he was preaching about the Son of God. And in unbelievable English, an oratory, he declared the wonders of the Son of God and how important it was to believe and to follow unconditionally the Son of God. And he went on to say that if we don't follow the Son of God, we'll die and go to hell. We sat there listening. We were intrigued. Then he finished by saying, by the way, I am the Son of God. False Christ. Thousand run after anything that comes across television these days, believing not in nothing, but in anything. We've got to get our thinking straight, our beliefs straight, friends, and then live by what we believe. Yes. Thousands of babies have been aborted since the abortion laws were approved. Do you think that God just overlooks it? Don't you think this coming a day 
while their blood cries from the grave to their creator, the giver of life. There's a movement now to make it a uni, uh, an international law. Millions of babies. There has been, over the last few decades, a holocaust of the slaughter of babies before they're even born. Do you know, it happened twice in the Bible when there was a holocaust of the slaughter of babies. And each time that it happened, it was a signal that a new era in history had been born. Happened way back in the book of Exodus. When an order was given from the highest court of the land, a decree was issued to kill the babies and a holocaust took place. The slaughter of these babies. Little did the Pharaoh of the day know that this was the signal of God for a new era, a new chapter in history to be born. And the Jews were about to march out of the land of Egypt to establish the Jewish nation that exists until tonight. It started then. It happened again in the New Testament when Jesus was born, you'll remember. And once again from the highest courts of the land, the order was given to kill the babies. And the Holocaust took place of babies being slaughtered. The cry went out in Ramah, because the babies were not. What a cruel day as the streets ran red with the blood of their beloved children. Little did those fools of that day know that a new era was coming into world history. A new day was being born. Christ had been born. A new kingdom had been established. Signaled by this Holocaust. We're at it again, friends, from the highest courts of the land. The decrees have been issued. We're now moving into the final phase of world history. Time has run out. The signals are clear. Jesus is about to return. About to return. The Bible says, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord of things in heaven, things in earth, and things under the earth. I've seen people sit in meetings like these and harden their hearts and walk out and say, I don't have to repent. I don't have to seek God. I've got my own kingdom that I built for myself. My friends, let me tell you, you will have to bow. Every tyrant in history will have to bow. Either we bow now on a voluntary basis in response to the call, or we will bow at the judgment seat on an involuntary basis. But you'll have to bow. And it's far better to bow now and to seek God in response to his voice. We can only respond When he speaks, don't harden your heart. This is not something we can take lightly. And tonight he calls you as a young man, as a young lady, as a mother, as a father, as a member of this congregation or some other congregation, and says, hey, I'm looking for my, my people. I'm looking for my servants. And you've just been coasting along, enjoying all the blessings. But somehow your heart is not walking with God and his will is not being fulfilled in your life. My friends, we're in crisis days. God wants those who become part of that remnant and who will follow him, cost what it may. Some years ago, on the border between Lebanon and Israel, two Israeli pilots were flying. They were shot down and they crashed 
on the wrong side of the border, they crashed in Lebanon in the jungles that were there. Terrorist movements were moving in on them to try and find these pilots. A message was sent back to Tel Aviv for rescue and a helicopter came. The helicopter had what they call a honing device to try and pick up and detect where possibly these men could be in the jungles below. And they picked up one man. They suddenly realized he was down there. He'd clambered up a tree. And they hovered over that tree to the time when that man could jump onto the skids of that helicopter and was hoisted to safety. They never found the other man. They patrolled all over, never found him. And the only conclusion that they drew was in that hour of need, when his honing vice, or the honing vice of the helicopter should connect with his, with his device, that his batteries had run dead. And there could be no connection. There could be no voice. And he was left down there. You see, friends, we've got to be connected. And maybe tonight there are those sitting here under the, under the sound of my voice, and your batteries have gone dead. And the call's about to happen. And the connection's not there. What does one do? Do we just leave it? Yes, there are many voices. Satan will plead, will claim that the voice of God came to John. And tonight, once again, the voice of the Spirit of God comes to you. He's been pleading for a long time. The harvest is past and we are not saved. You are not sure, you cannot sleep tonight absolutely sure that your sins are forgiven. That if you died tonight, you'd go to heaven. The summer is ended, the harvest is past. We are not saved. Others are sitting here tonight you can point back to that day when you gave your heart to Jesus. You can remember to that time when you were baptized. That's all it's been. It's just a past event. You're not serving God. We're just coasting along. Thank God for those who committed. Send them to the mission if you like. Give money if necessary. As long as I don't have to go. Why must they be more committed than us here? Has God that, got that kind of distinction? That just as the missionary out there has to be totally surrendered and committed, we, we're the same here. It's just a case of where we're serving him, but where are my servants? He's calling his servants like never before. Let's not miss what God wants to do in these days. You see, only revival will save this nation. I don't know if we want that. It'll interrupt your lifestyle. But I hate to think of the alternative. Amen. He's calling us, no matter who we are, to a level of dedication that we've never known before. Never known before. We have to be willing to pay the price. And the only thing I can say to try and persuade you is, thank God Jesus paid the price. He treasured you and me so much that there was no price big enough that he could not pay. I'm asking you tonight, my friend, to make that decision and say, God, I'm prepared to be your servant. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll be what you want me to be. And I'll do what you want me to do. Don't miss that opportunity. God's got something special for you. Hear his voice. Shall we bow in prayer? Father, put your seal upon your word tonight.